Now in chapter four, we're gonna be talking about movement across cell membranes. So in chapter three, we discussed what the structure of the cell membrane was. Now we'll talk about how do things cross across or move across that cell membrane, either into the cell or out of the cell. So these are the topics that we'll be talking about. We'll talk first off about diffusion, and then we'll talk about mediated transport systems. We'll also talk about the movement of water, which is scientifically termed osmosis. Then we'll talk about endocytosis versus exocytosis, and then about epithelial transport. So I kind of just added this little slide here to um, get a couple of things um, so we can kind of agree on a couple of issues here. Okay, when we talk about the movement of molecules, um, molecules will either be moving along their concentration gradient or against their concentration gradient. So what does along the concentration gradient mean? It means that it is going from an area of high concentration um, to an area of low concentration. So let's say we're talking about the movement of glucose. So if it is moving, if the glucose is moving from an area of high concentration of glucose along the concentration gradient to another area of low glucose concentration, we are going to call that that we will say that glucose moved along or with the concentration gradient. And because it's from high to low, it is a lot easier and no energy is needed, no ATP is needed. It is a passive process. But if you compare that to going up the slide, okay, so you're going against, you're going uphill or against the concentration gradient, in this, um, then you would flip that example. So the molecule will be going from an area of low concentration to an area of higher concentrations. And this is a little bit harder. And that process is an active process that needs ATP. Okay, so you kind of want to keep that in mind when we discuss the need of ATP or not. So the first one is diffusion. Diffusion is the passive movement of molecules from one area um, to another area. So, so now that we know it's a passive movement, we know that it does not need energy. We know that the movement is going to be from an area of high to low concentration. And that's just going to be by, you know, the mere fact that molecules are always in constant movement. And that is known as simple diffusion. So I'll give you an example. If you put a cube of sugar in a glass of water, okay, do not stir it and leave it overnight, you will find that that cube of sugar disappeared. And these sugar molecules have been distributed throughout the whole glass of water. That is due to the random movement of these sugar molecules. That is known as simple diffusion, okay? Diffusion is continuous, but it will reach a state of equilibrium where now the whole glass of water, um, the very top of the glass has the same concentration of sugar um, as the very bottom of the glass. That's when a state of equilibrium um, occurs. So you can see here in simple diffusion, this is an area of high concentration, um, and this is an area of low concentration. So simple diffusion means that these molecules are going to spread from this end to that end until it reaches a stage of equilibrium. At this stage, um, there will really no, be um, no net diffusion in either direction. Here you can see um, in this example, there is no membrane, okay? But in our cells, we do actually have a membrane. So you can see here that there's two compartments with a membrane in the middle, okay? The molecules here have higher concentrations than what is present in compartment two. So these molecules are going to be pushed in this direction, 
Okay, so while these molecules um, are, because they're also moving, some of them are still going to be pushed in the opposite direction. But your net result would be movement from the direct in the direction from compartment one into compartment two. So again, your net flux of movement would be from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Now that again is the uh, concept of simple diffusion. Now diffusion can happen, um, but for shorter distances, okay? So diffusion is limited by the distance that it needs to um, move. So if a substance has to diffuse over a long distance, that could happen, but it would be um, very slow, okay? And it wouldn't really be an effective way to move different things for long distances um, using just simple diffusion. The body will use different things or different um, methods to transport molecules if they have to be transported for longer distances. So simple diffusion could be, for example, you know, oxygen and carbon dioxide diffusing across the air sacs in the lungs, okay? These are very short distances. The concentration gradients are perfect. So diff simple diffusion, it would be the way to go in those areas. Now, the fusion across the membranes um, is also limited by what is known as the permeability coefficient. So some molecules can diffuse a lot easier than others. And each molecule would get a number known as the permeability coefficient. Okay. The... Um, one of the major factors that could limit diffusion is the hydrophobic anterior of the bilipid layer. So if you guys remember the cell membrane, the inside of the cell membrane was made out of the hydrophobic tails. Now these hydrophobic tails are one of the major reasons substances cannot diffuse through the cell membrane. Things that can are usually smaller molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide or high, um, lipophilic, like they do like lipids, like fatty acids and steroid hormones. So, and I have it at the bottom of the slide. So what are the molecules that can easily diffuse through cell membranes? They are usually the smaller molecules they are nonpolar, okay, so they usually do not have a positive end and a negative end. They're usually not charged, so they are nonpolar. They are lipophilic. They would be, they, um, you want them to like fat, okay, so that they could cross that fatty cell membrane. Um, lipophilic is the same as hydrophobic. So if you have all three of these combined in a molecule, these are the molecules that can easily diffuse through your cell membrane. Okay, so again, you wanna be small, you do not wanna be a battery, so you wanna be nonpolar. You wanna like fat, you wanna be lipophilic, and hate water, which is hydrophobic. Okay, so these are the characteristics of the molecules that can diffuse easily through the cell membrane. Um, so again, you know, the classic examples are oxygen and carbon dioxide, which are the gases that transport in the lungs, fatty acids, and steroid hormones. Those are your classical examples of those. Okay, things, though, that are the opposite. So if something is polar, a polar molecule, which is a molecule that acts like a battery. It has a positive end and a negative end. Those um, are not going to be able to cross the cell membrane using simple diffusion. They would have to use other methods to cross that cell membrane. Okay, so um, for example, ions. Okay, ions are either positively charged or negatively charged. So we would expect that ions cannot cross the cell membrane using simple diffusion. 
they can get through the cell membrane, but not through simple diffusion. They would have to find different methods in order to get in or out of the cell. And they do that through these protein channels. So if you remember in the cell membrane, there were uh, protein channels, these um, integral proteins that acted like tunnels, connecting the inside to the outside of the cell. Some of these channels will allow um, ions to either get in or out of the cell. Okay. Um, these channels are selective, meaning that, again, they will not let anything in or out. Okay, they'll selective depending on the charge of the ion, um, depending upon the size of the ion. So these channels have different diameters, and they would allow the smaller ones to get in, but they will prevent the bigger um, channel, sorry, the bigger molecules from getting in. And it also depends on the charge of the channel. So let us say that a positively charged channel, do you think it would allow the sodium to pass through or the chloride to pass through? Remember that the channel is positively charged. So that positively charged channel will most probably attract the negative chloride and repel the positive sodium. So there is a lot kind of going on with these channels. So it depends on the size of the channel it depends on the charge on the channel as well. Okay, so again, these channels are, the protein channels are very selective on what they, what which ions they would let in or not. Now, membrane potential. Membrane potential is an extremely important topic because if we understand the what the resting potential looks like, which is basically the electricity of the cell membrane at rest, we are going to use that information and when we talk about action potential, which is how you know electricity passing on nerves. It is also very important when we get to talk about how the muscles contract. Okay, so the membrane potential, which is fancy terms for what is the electricity across the cell membrane, meaning that the inside of the cell is negatively charged, while the outside of the cell is positively charged. Okay, so there is an image that will show you that. So there are ions that keep on moving in and out of the cell, okay? But again, the distribution of these ions are in a certain method where the inside of the cell is negatively charged in comparison or in relationship to the outside of the cell. So we'll see that in this image right here. Here is your intracellular fluid, and this is your extracellular fluid. So across the plasma membrane, the inside is negatively charged in relationship to the outside. We've got potassium, sodium ions, chloride ions, proteins that are negatively charged, um, all different kinds of ions or, and polar molecules that play in to the uh, membrane potential. But at the end of the day, the fact is that the inside of the cell is negatively charged in comparison to the outside of the cell. Okay, so what is the main intracellular cation? Okay, so kind of, you know, a couple of of common things to know. Intracellular means what is what is the most common positively charged ion inside of the cell? And that would be potassium, okay? Um, while the most common positively charged ion on the outside of the cell is sodium. Okay, but wait a minute. You just told us that the inside is negative. So how, why is it that potassium that's positive, how is it inside of the cell? Remember what I said is there that there are lots of ions that play into this, okay? And their distribution determines the end result of this membrane potential. So yes, although there is a lot of potassium inside of the cell, but the cell also has a lot of proteins that are negatively charged as well, okay? And it has lots of negatively charged ions, okay? so. Although potassium is the most important positively charged ion inside of the cell, it is 
overcome by all of the other negatively charged stuff. Now again, the most common extracellular cation is sodium. Okay, know that um, the cell membrane has what are known as leaking channels and leaking pores. These pores are going to leak potassium and sodium all over the place. So this positively charged, you know, the potassium that's inside of the cell will always want to escape towards the outside. Same with the sodium. Sodium will always want to leak into the cell. And we cannot have that going on, okay? You always want sodium out, potassium in. And um, the fact that the inside of the cell is negative will make it easier for these sodium ions to get pulled into the cell, okay? And I have this one question because it's going to come up later on. So which ion could easily leak into the cell? Would it be a negatively chloride ion or a sodium ion? Again, because sodium is positive and the inside is negative, so it is a lot easier for sodium to leak into the cell due to the attraction to these negatives um, then a chloride ion would be um, leaking into the cell. Okay, so now the regulation of diffusion through these ion channels. Ion channels are not, like I said, they, um, they are very selective in what kind of ions they would let in or out, depending on the size, depending on the charge, and so on. They're all, some of them also have gates. Okay, and we call these gated channels. The gate have different keys. So some of the keys are chemicals, and we call those chemically gated channels or ligand gated channels because there has to be a link between the chemical and the gate. So the chemical, again, again we call these ligand gated or chemically gated. Or it could open due to a change in voltage. Okay, we call that voltage gated channels. Or it could be actually like an actual gate, okay, and we call that a mechanically gated channel. So you see here, this channel is shut down, it's closed. And when the um, gate opens, so you can see this mechanically gated channel is now open, and that will lead um, to the leaking of sodium or potassium or whatever, you know, cells that we're talking about at the, for these certain cells. Sometimes channels would change their shape, okay? They can change, they can conform into different shapes. So for example, right here is an open ion channel, and then it could just squeeze back and shut down. Okay, again, how do these channels open? Well, there are different ways. It could be due to the change in um, voltage. So those could be voltage gated, or it could be chemically gated. Um, so again, you know, the, why they open and why they shut down is due to different factors that the cells are being exposed to. Now let's talk about mediated transport systems or facilitated diffusion. So now that we know what diffusion is, okay, diffusion was the passive um, transport of things across the cell membrane from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. But we said that not everything can be, not everything can diffuse. Some molecules are either too big or too polar. Um, and the, in that case, they are going to need some help to get across the cell membrane. And that is what facilitated diffusion is. Where there will be a transporter transporting these bigger molecules across the cell membrane usually, for example, amino acids and glucose, okay? Um, we also call that kind of transported transport, we also call it mediated transport. So facilitated diffusion is the same as mediated transport. Here you can see an example of mediated transport where this is the inside of the cell, this is the outside of the cell. Okay, this molecule right here, let us say, remember we said in order to diffuse through the cell membrane, 
it would have to be small. You want to be non-polar. And you also have to be lipophilic. You have to like fat. Let us assume that that is not the case for this molecule. Okay, so the, this molecule will not be able to go through diffusion. It has to find a transporter, and this is what this blue thing is. It will transport, it will have a binding site, and that binding site, when the molecule attaches to the binding site, this transporter will change its shape. So now you see it, it's, it has changed its shape, allowing for that molecule to be transported into the cell. Okay, these binding sites are specific, which means that if this transporter is a glucose transporter, it will only open up, it will only activate if glucose attaches to the binding site. But if an amino acid comes in, nothing happens. Um, so again, it is kind of limited by the number of transporters and by the specificity of these binding sites. The transporters are usually proteins. Okay, and like I said, they are chemically specific to what the molecules that they are going to link to or to their binding sites. And they cannot, they're not as fast as di simple diffusion is. Okay, so simple diffusion is basically the molecule just, you know, zooming through the cell membrane. Um, which is a lot faster. Facilitated diffusion, though, is limited because of time. So you, 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 the molecule has to attach to the binding site, the protein changes its shape, and then it has to go back to its original position, and it keeps on doing that. So that takes a little bit more time than simple diffusion. Okay, so transporters are a little slower than simple diffusion. And then these transporters can become saturated. Okay, so there is actually, they can re reach a maximal level and where they are no longer able to transport molecules anymore. And this is what happens in diabetic patients. So in diabetic patients, um, the high level of glucose in the bloodstream can saturate these transporters Okay, so glucose will be transported into the cell, but because there is so much glucose out here, way outnumbering the number of transporters, that glucose is now going to leak in the urine, leading to glucosuria, which means leakage of glucose in urine. And that occurs due to the um, reaching the maximal capacity of glucose transporters on the cell membranes. And here you can see, you know, diffusion can pretty much keep on going forever. Okay, the more oxygen there is, oxygen will keep on diffusing into the cell. While mediated transport is really limited by the, as we said, the specificity of the transporter and the number of the transporters. So once you reach the maximal capacity of those transporters, um, you know, you could no longer increase the um, ability of these transporters. They are very, they're limited in their abilities. Active transport is the same as facilitated transport, except that it transports things uphill. It transports molecules against their concentration gradients. And the name is telling you that it is an active transporter. It me needs energy in order to do that. So, um, and we call these pumps because they are going to be pumping molecules against their concentration gradients. The source of energy can either be ATP, okay, and we call that primary active transport, or it could be the battery, which remember we said the inside of the cell is negative and the outside is positive. So that electrochemical gradient across the cell membrane acts as a battery and that we will call that secondary active transport. So if the source of energy is ATP, 
we break down ATP into ADP and phosphate, releasing the energy that was there, we call that primary active transport. But if the transporter is relying on the electrochemical gradient across the cell membrane, which means in plain English that the inside of the cell is negative and the outside is positive, that means that this transporter is a secondary active transporter. Okay, before we move on, we want to highlight the differences between simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and active transport. So in simple diffusion, things go from high concentration to low concentration. There is no transporter in the middle. In facilitated diffusion, molecules go from high concentration to low concentration, but there is a transporter. Okay, remember that we need this transporter if the molecules do not follow these criteria. If the molecule is too big, um, if it is polar, and if it is lipophobic, if it's afraid of fat. Okay, in that case, they would need a transporter, and we will term that facilitated diffusion. Active transport would be from an area of low concentration to high concentration, and we do need a transporter. Okay, so to kind of highlight the differences again, these two go with the concentration gradient. This one needs a transporter, though. So... Now that we look at these two, both of them need transporters. So what's the difference? The difference is that this one goes with the concentration gradient and is a passive process, while this one goes against the concentration gradient and is an active process. The infamous example of active transport is the sodium-potassium pump. Remember we said that the norm is Sodium needs to be on the outside of the cell. Potassium needs to be on the inside of the cell. We also mentioned that there are leaking channels. There's lots of leaking of sodium and potassium. So we, there's always a need to kick sodium out, okay, and to keep potassium in. And that's what the sodium-potassium pump does. The sodium-potassium pump has... It does need ATP. It has an enzyme that will break the ATP, and that enzyme is known as the ATPase enzyme. When three sodium ions attach to those binding sites, the ATPase enzyme will break the ATP into ADP and phosphate that will release the energy that was stored in there now this transporter or that pump will change its shape. It will spit out those three sodium ions out of the cell and take two sodium ions into the cell, okay? And it will release that last phosphate and then attach to another one so the cycle keeps on going over and over again. Other examples of primary active transports uh, would be um, calcium ATPase, and we'll talk about this one when we talk about um, muscles, the muscle contraction. Hydrogen ion ATPases and hydrogen slash potassium ATPase. Okay, so although the most important one is your sodium potassium pump, and like I said, you'll find that on every single cell in the body, it is extremely important to maintain the resting membrane potential, always making sure that sodium is kicked out and potassium is kept in. Okay, to make, to maintain a high intracellular potassium level and low intracellular sodium levels. Okay, that is important to maintain that cell membrane potential and this is how cells um, can function. 
And these are just other examples of active transporters that we also have in the body. So what is a secondary active transport? We said that it also needs energy, but that energy will be coming from a battery. The fact that the inside of the cell membrane is negative while the outside is positive, that's what's going to fuel the energy needed for this transporter to work. So we use the electrochemical gradient across the plasma membrane. Um, usually, it, you, um, a lot of this usually depends on sodium. So remember we said sodium, I'm just gonna go back to that image for one second and then we'll come back. Remember we said that there's lots of sodium on the outside and because it's positive, it can be, it will easily leak towards the, and be pulled through towards that negatively charged inside of the cell. And we are going to use that um, fact where sodium tries to sneak into the cell and it will pull things with it. Okay, so that is the secondary active transport. We are really depending on the fact that sodium is pos positive and it will be attracted to the negative inside of the cell. And most of the time, it will pull things with it, like glucose. Okay, and that is known as a co-transporter. So the sodium will be the main thing um, initiating this transporter, and then it will co-transport something with it, which is glucose. So basically what is happening is that sodium is like, okay, I'm positive, the inside of the cell is negative, I'm more attracted towards the inside of the cell. As I'm going in, I might as well take something with me. I'm going to take a molecule of glucose and co-transport this with me. That is known as co-transport, where I am taking the glucose molecule inside of the cell with me. Okay, it's known as co-transport or simp-court. Simport, okay? So where the sodium and glucose are both going in the same direction. But it could be that um, sodium will be going in while the pump is pumping something else out, okay? And in that case, we are going to call that a counter transport or antiport, where the sodium is moving in one direction and the other molecule is moving in the opposite direction. You want to be familiar with both of these terms. Okay, and again, the driving force behind this is the positively charged sodium ions. I'm just going to go back to this right here to show you how these transporters work. It's basically the same thing, kind of like the sodium potassium pump, where you have the binding site. The sodium will attach to that binding site. This will lead to the activation of your transporter. Um, this purple is the glucose molecule that it will co-transport with it. So sodium is like, I don't want to go in all by myself. I want to grab a molecule of glucose and take it with me. Now the transporter opens and it will push or kind of kick the sodium along with that glucose molecule to the inside of the cell. Okay, remember sodium has to leave. Sodium needs to be on the outside. So if I ask you which pump will be responsible for kicking the sodium back out, hopefully you are able to um, connect that I was talking about the sodium potassium pump. So the sodium potassium pump that we just talked about will make sure that all of that sodium that's leaking in gets kicked back out of the cell. So this would be a good time to take a break, and then um, I'll see you shortly. Okay, so welcome back, folks. Now we'll start talking about the movement of water. Because water is very special, it has its own um, name when it moves, and that process is known as osmosis. So whenever you read the word osmosis, you automatically know, okay, again, one of those reflexes that we'll get through the course is that you hear the term osmosis, it means the passage of water. 
If you are asked, is osmosis the passage of blood? No, although blood is a fluid, but no. Osmosis is the passage of water across the cell membrane, okay? Um, cell membranes have these little pores known as aqua porins, and um, as you can see where the name comes from, so aqua means water, porins are pores, um, and this is where the water is can kind of leak in and out of the cell. Some cells have more aquaporins than others. For so, for example, you could you would imagine that the kidneys, kidney cells would have lots of aquaporins since it's responsible for making urine. Okay, these aquaporins we can either shut them down or open them up depending on how much water the kidneys need to get rid of. So if you say are overhydrated and the kidney needs to get rid of lots of water, it would open up a whole bunch of aquaporins and allow for all that water to be released into the urine. But let's say you're dehydrated and the kidneys want to keep all that water in the body, it will shut down these aquaporins and keep the water from being um, released into the urine. Okay, so right here you have a glass of water. Okay, just pure water. And so it has a high concentration of water. Okay, if when you start to dissolve something in it, okay, whatever you're dissolving in there is known as the solute. So we'll say maybe you're dissolving salt. You put these purple salt molecules, it will start displacing the water molecules. Okay. So this now solution has a lower water concentration. Okay, so this sometimes gets confusing um, where when we look at the, the um, concentrations in the terms of, you know, is this a concentration or a diluted solution? Well, this is definitely a diluted solution and this is a more concentrated one. But if you look at it in the terms of water, this one has a higher water concentration, while this one has a lower water concentration, okay? So you wanna kinda of pay attention as to what the concentration we're talking about. Um, so, concentrated solutions, okay? So the more salt you dissolve in the solution, that means you get lower water concentrations. So hopefully this wasn't too confusing. If it is, you might wanna go back and listen to it again. Now osmolarity is the total amount of sol solute in a solution, meaning how much salt did you dissolve in that water? The more salt you dissolve in there, the higher the osmolarity. Okay, so higher Osmolarities, again, would mean lower water concentrations. So, I'll, so when we talk about osmolarity, we are technically talking about the concentration of the salt. We're talking about the concentration of the solute. But it also gives you an idea about how much water there is in there. So there is that inverse relationship between... Um, you know, the osmolarity and water concentration. So again, going to this example, this is a co highly concentrated solution, but with low water concentration, the osmolarity here is higher than it is in this upper image. The higher the osmolic, the um, higher the osmolarity, means that it has the ability to pull water. Okay, so think about it this way. Whenever patients come in that have high blood pressure, what do you tell them to do regarding their salt intake? Do you tell them, you know what, I am going to prescribe you two bags of chips a day, or do you ask them to lower their salt intake? You ask them to lower their salt intake, okay? So you do not want, because the more salt they eat in or they take into their bodies, that will pull more water as well and keep the water in their bodies. And that will further raise their blood pressures. Okay, so um, higher osmol uh, high solutions with high osmolarity, 
have the ability to pull water. Okay, so going back to these pictures, this solution with high osmolarity will pull water from the one on the bottom, so from the one on the top. So water will be going from top to bottom. So tonic solutions, when we talk that in terms of human physiology, we are go, um, an isotonic solution. Iso means the same. Isotonic solution would be a solution that has the same amount of salt as the extra, extracellular fluid. So the outside of the cells are full of fluid. And there is a certain amount of salt that is dissolved in that fluid. It is at exactly 0.9% of sodium chloride. Any solution that is at that same concentration is considered an isotonic solution. And that's why if anybody is given an, IV, an intravenous drip of saline, that saline has to be isotonic at 0.9% sodium chloride concentrations so that you are giving them the exact same salt concentration that's in their body. Okay, hypotonic solution though would be <clears throat> um, a solution that is at, at a lower concentration. For instance, 0.1%. So this 0.1% is less than 0.9, and that means that um, the tonicity is less. We are going to call that a hypotonic solution. A solution with more salt dissolved in it, for example, 5% sodium chloride, that is known as a hypertonic solution. Now the safe one is your isotonic. Hypo or hypertonic solutions are not safe to give to patients and we'll understand why when we get here. So this, let us, let us pretend that this is a red blood cell. Okay, so, and then these little dots are your particles, your salts, and whatever that whatever's inside of the red blood cell. If you put the RBC, which stands for red blood cell, if you put it in an isotonic solution, okay, water will neither be pulled in or out of the cell, okay, because the concentrations on both sides are the same. So isotonic solution leads to no change in the cell volume. And again, that's what you want. But if you put it in a hypo, hypotonic solution, which means that the concentration on the outside is less than what it is on the inside. In other words, the inside of your red blood cell Where did the arrow go? The inside of the red blood cell, it is at a higher concentration than it is on the outside. That will lead to pulling water into the cell. So again, we've got more salt inside than we have on the outside. All of that salt on the inside will pull water towards the inside of the cell, leading it to swell up and that it could eventually burst. So putting a cell in hypotonic solution leads to cell swelling and maybe even bursting. And the opposite happens if you put a cell in hypertonic solution. So you see here this higher concentration liquid that's surrounding this cell is going to pull water out of the cell. And that leads to shrinking of the cell. So th this cell has basically been dehydrated and that will also kill the cell. Now we'll move on to endo versus exocytosis. Both of these are active processes, meaning that they need um, ATP in order to happen. Endo means to enter the cell. Exo means to exit the cell. So this right here is the inside of the cell, this yellow side, while the blue side is the outside of the cell. And this right here is your cell membrane. So we'll talk about endocytosis first, where we need to, um, the cell sometimes need to, needs to take in things, okay? 
We'll talk about the things in a minute. When it does so, it will invaginate. Um, you know, these particles will push through the cell membrane and then actually detach from the cell membrane, making this little vesicle. So the wall of this vesicle is actually detached from the plasma membrane. Okay, that process is known as endocytosis. If you reverse the process, that would be exocytosis, where, remember when we made protein in Chapter 3, we are now going to remember that vesicle, the wall of the vesicle was made out of the membrane of the Golgi apparatus. And these are our little proteins that we want to release from the cell or secrete. So what happens is that the cell membrane here attaches to this membrane. It opens up. It will release the protein while this is now now becomes part of the cell membrane. So we are pretty much replacing the membrane that we've lost due to endocytosis from the wall of the Golgi apparatus. Now again, endocytosis refers to the movement of molecules into the cell. Okay, if the cell is drinking, we call that a process of pinocytosis. If it's eating, that's phagocytosis. If there has to be a key to let things in, and that key is known as a receptor, that is known as receptor-mediated endocytosis. So we'll see the examples right here. So here is your cell, here is the extracellular fluid, and this cell is now thirsty and it needs to take in some water. It is obviously, the water is always going to have some kind of salt or something dissolved in it, but your main aim is to take in water. That process of um, intaking water through endocytosis gets a special name known as penocytosis, so fluid endocytosis. While in this example, if this is, in, say, one of the white blood cells, and it found a bacteria, and it's going to eat it up, okay? Again, it kind of forms these two arms around the bacteria, kind of hugging it, and then it, bring it brings it into the cell. This process of eating um, a a solid object, in this case, the bacteria, is known as phagocytosis. The third kind would be having a key um, where something would have to attach to these keys or receptors in order to get into the cell. And that process is known as receptor-mediated endocytosis. Now, exocytosis is the movement of molecules out of the cell. So remember, again, when we made that protein, um, we packaged it into in the Golgi apparatus, and then we send it out as a secretory vesicle. Now we want to send out the protein into the outside world, okay? We do that through a process known as exocytosis, which, again, is an active process that needs ATP. It is important, not only are we releasing the protein, we are also replacing the cell membrane or parts of the cell membrane that we lost due to endocytosis. Okay, so we're replacing it. Um, so kind of going back to this image, as we lose parts of the cell membrane due to endocytosis, we replace it through this process of exocytosis. Now, a little bit about epithelial cell terminology before we talk about, you know, how things can get in and out of the cell um, kind of like at the same time. Okay, the cell, and I'm going to use the image to talk about this, and then I'll go back and kind of go over the slides. So this right here is an epithelial cell. So we're not, in this case, we're not talking about connective tissue. We're not talking about muscle or nervous tissue. We're talking about epithelial tissue. So this epithelial tissue has a cell membrane towards the lumen, okay, towards a um, tunnel, 
And this membrane is known as the apical membrane. So this side of the membrane is an apical membrane. While the opposite side that is towards the blood vessels is known as the basolateral membranes. Okay, so let's say that this is an intestinal cell. This is a cell lining the inside of the small intestine. So the part of the cell attached to the lumen of the intestine is known as the apical membrane, while the other side that is close to the bloodstream or close to the serosal covering of the intestine is known as the basolateral membrane. In order for things to be absorbed through the small intestine, it would have to go in one side out the other. So it'd have to go in through the apical membrane and exit through the basolateral membrane into the bloodstream. And we call that transcellular pathway. Transcellular pretty much means that it went in one through one and exited the other. So it had to cross through the cell, hence the name transcellular pathway. But not everything, we should know that by now, not everything can do that, okay? Some molecules are just too big. Some molecules are just too polar, meaning they have positive and negative ends. Um, some molecules just cannot really go through the cell membrane. They would have to go through these tight junctions. Remember we said that the small intestinal cells are attached by tight junctions. And if they would have to squeeze, if a substance would have to squeeze itself through these tight junctions, we call that paracellular pathway. And you would imagine that this pathway is a lot harder. Okay, some medications, though, are really big molecules. For example, L-thyroxine. So if somebody has a gets a thyroidectomy, which is the surgical removal of the thyroid gland, they would have to take synthetic thyroid sorry, synthetic thyroxine, which is the hormone for life. That synthetic thyroxine is a huge molecule. It cannot be absorbed through the transcellular pathway. It gets absorbed through the paracellular pathway. But the thing is that because this is such a tight junction, not all of the thyroxine is going to be absorbed. So if they take one pill, only 40% of it is going to be absorbed. And we call that bioavailability. So the bioavailability of, thyro of synthetic thyroxine is 40%. Because, again, only 40% of it will be absorbed while the majority actually is going to be um, discarded and with the waste products. Okay? Now there's a, you know... A famous question that keeps on coming up and pops up on your Learn Smart and on different areas. So I just wanted to kind of touch up on it. The concentration of sodium throughout the body, just because that is such an important topic and there's sodium plays an important role in different things. So which parts, which compartments have the highest concentrations of sodium? From high to low, you have more sodium here, okay, in this... Um, um, on the blood slide of things, okay, so in this extracellular fluid here. And then you would have, following that, so number two would be sodium in the lumen side, and then the least would be intracellularly. Okay, so again, number one, extracellular over here, number two on the side of the lumen, number three would be inside of the cell. And I believe, yep, that was the end of chapter four.